Welcome to episode 25 of Real Talk. We are here at my loft in my apartment with John Green. Amazingly made it safely to Brooklyn. Now, if you're unaware, the reason that John is here is we had a football bet. I'm a Jet fan. He's a Giant fan. Whoever's team had the worst record would have to go to the other person's house and film. So you were the loser of that bet. But honestly, we we're both losers for rooting for these teams. Yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, I, I, by the end, I have to admit, I was rooting for post position in the draft more so than winning winning uh, games at that point. Um, but that's the life of a Jets or a Giants fan, at least in the in the twenties. Honestly, like <clears throat> it's, neither of us, our teams are really relevant or you know in the playoffs or anything. But I feel like with the Lions blowing that seventeen point lead, spiritually, <laughs> it was like the Jets were in the playoffs. So, sorry, sorry, Lions fans. <laughs> Talk is sponsored by Facing Tipton. Now, right now, we talked about this last week. The Lothenbach dispersal at Facing Tipton is going on this week. It's a digital sale. Got a lot, lots of nice brood mares, horses of racing age, turnkey horses. Obviously, a great fam, a lot of great families, a great breeding and owning operation. So you can go right now on the Facing website, go to the digital platform, and bid on those horses. And also, we got the Facing Tipton winter mix sale, which is next week, February fifth, February fifth, and sixth in Lexington. Lots of really nice horses. I think you can find some diamonds in the rough there before we get into like the peak of sale season. So go check that out and go check out the Lothenbach dispersal as well. Facing makes it super easy to bid on a digital platform. And yeah, digital sales coming up in March, April, May, and June as well. FacingTipton.com. So unfortunately, the Rail Talk Derby did not result in any of the three of us getting to the winner's circle. But Lauren Carlisle did get the win out of the three of us with I'm Very Busy running a really nice fast closing second. Uh, behind Warm Heart in that race. Webslinger had a little bit of a tough trip. Integration had a little bit of a tough trip. We're still very proud of them. They both still ran very big figures. Uh, I, I just, my takeaway from that race was that Ryan Moore is just an awesome, awesome rider. Yeah. And I don't know, it's, it's your American-centric thing. I would love to see him come and ride in America full-time at some point just to see how he stacks up with the American jockey colonies because he stole that race. Honestly, like he's to me where he was to me where integration should have been. Like they should have had reverse positions and he just, he got to jump on everybody. He's not scared to come up the rail. It was a terrific race. And it was, you know, I think a lot of those horses are going to win great stakes uh, going through it out the rest of the season. But yeah, that was my takeaway. What did you think? No, it was definitely a springboard race, Joe. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Going into the race, we talked about just how impressive top to bottom the, uh, you know, the entries were um, and they didn't disappoint. You know, Ryan Moore, I think, is the story of the race, like, like you've mentioned, because he out jockeyed everyone else in the race. He out jockeyed the Eclipse, you know, award winning Ira Ortiz, his brother Jose and, and the rest of the colony. And it wasn't even so much that he like, you know, in, in European racing, you have a little more room. The, the, the tracks, you know, are much wider. So you have the ability to kind of navigate a little bit easier. He cut to the rail. I mean, he, he, had, he had a choice and he saw everyone else kind of fanning out and he went right up the rail reminiscent of the Breeders' Cup um, when he did, you know, when he did that also in, in, in the turf race. So Ryan Moore, to me, you know, you walk away from that race and you say, look, it's a great story. Warm heart won um, against the boys, against the older boys. Now she's being bred to triple crown winning, justified, mm -hmm. probably arguably, you know, the best uh, stallion in the country, if not maybe the top three in the world. Um, and, uh, and, and she ended on a high note. So she ended up winning and now she's going to go to, to justify and, and start her new career. And she not only beat the boys, but she beat them and broke the track record. Yeah. I mean, which was really, really impressive on, on top of everything else. Now, again, she was navigated perfectly mm -hmm. in order to, 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 you know, to hit the wire first. But she's that talented. I mean, she just deserved to be in the winner's circle, quite frankly. And this is coming from somebody that owned a horse in the race. If we didn't win or you didn't win, I definitely wanted her to win. Um, and then Lauren's horse. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, maybe we should have to go to Lauren's house for, uh, for the next episode <laughs> because she beat the both of us. Yeah. Listen, like, and 
it was just it's it it turned out as it looked on paper, just a stellar field. Like integration ran fifth and got a ninety eight buyer. Web Slinger ran sixth and got a ninety six buyer. Like those numbers will win a lot of stakes. All grade ones, frankly, yeah. in most years. Yep. So, but it was it was just a, a super super field, and I think you know it turned out to be more interesting than the dirt race. National Treasure won the dirt race. You know, he was he was the best horse I think on paper going into the race, even though we didn't mention him. I realized we went through the race last week. I think that was, that was by design by me. I don't know why you were skewing I, him. I was but. talking about how I forgot who was in the race. Right, so I right. proved it by not mentioning the favorite. Um, so he got a 105 buyer. He's, I guess, is like the leader in the clubhouse in the handicap division. But it's just, there's nobody really to write home about. No. Uh, I thought Hoist the Gold ran a really good race um, for Dallas Stewart. So I'm happy for him. But yeah, anybody out there, anybody got like a four-year-old, five-year-old that they're excited about, like, Enter them in some big races because, like, there's really nobody to be scared of this year, it seems. No, and, and, and I was happy to see Senior Buscador run the way he did because mm-hmm. there's a horse that is off the beaten path. He's not he's not trained by a superstar, by, by a mega trainer. He's not owned by, you know, by, by the, the big names in the industry. And, uh, and you know, Junior Alvarado, who, who rode the horse, isn't a big name in Florida. He's mm-hmm. doing really well in his own career, um, but he's not, when you say, who are the top five um, jockeys in the in the country, Junior Alvarado is not in that in that conversation. So the fact that he just kept riding the horse and riding the horse, and even though National Treasure looked like he was going to win, um, you know, even more impressively than, than he did at the end, and galloping out those first fifty yards after the after the wire, you can make the case that Senior Buscador was was the best horse in the race. Yeah, and he's just his style is such that that Gulfstream track is always going to play against, against that him. and play yeah. towards the strengths of a horse like National Treasure. I love Senior Buscador because I wrote a story. Back when I was at the TDN a couple years ago right. on Joe Peacock, the owner slash breeder and the mayor, the desert god mayor has like five stakes winners from five falls to race. And I wrote it back, back when the senior Buscador won the springboard mile and was right. like going to be a derby contender. And then he got injured and had to miss a triple crown season. Right. And he came back and had run some like so-so races, but he's really, really come around this year. He obviously won the San Diego at Del Mar last year, he ran pretty well in the Breeders' Cup. Like he's had, he's he's come around in a really nice way. And like you say, like it's nice to see those small operations step up and be able to win or run big right. in some big races. And yeah, it was an interesting story because it was the last horse that Joe Peacock Jr. bred with his dad. Oh, so wow. that was like that, that meant a lot to them. So we're, yep. we're I mean, you know, I love to see horses like that run big. Yep. And yeah, if he gets into some ra- into some races with you know a little bit more pace. On a little bit fairer of a track, he's mm-hmm. going to win some some big pots this year. He is, and, and the other thing, since we're talking about um, you know forgotten names and and maybe names that are out of the limelight, how about Mineshaft? I mean, here's a horse that you know historically is one of the most solid stallions around. Doesn't get the book of mares because he's just not sexy and he's older. Um, but he had two horses hit the board mm-hmm. in the in the uh, in the Pegasus, and you know the fact that he had two horses in the field is is you know enough to kind of sit up and take notice, but. Um, he's still a bargain. I think he's like at ten thousand dollars. He's like, the man. He was like one of my favorite handicap horses growing up. Like I started watching racing in '03, and he was like big in '03 and '04. Right. And you know, just one. He was one of those horses that showed up every single time and, and just ran huge. And you know, like you say, he wasn't he wasn't flashy, but man, was he rock solid. And it's it's great to see him. His influence still being there 20 plus years later. Right. Um, I mean, unless you got anything else to say about those races, there is some news about the Pegasus and a similar- Let's go to that. Similar that's, that's more important than Pegasus. anything I can say. Yep. <laughs> Going forward. So you, you know, John, this, this, this is a little microcosm of the show. John's got his notes here. This, this is just me going off the top of my head, but he's an A student. Um, so he's got plenty. He's got plenty to say. It's so just because I don't. I don't have a memory like you do. I don't have a memory of a thirty-five-year-old anymore. So it's all the weed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not arguing about that either. <laughs> but yeah. So so during the Pegasus broadcast, Belinda Stronic came on and was talking about having a new event similar to the Pegasus out in California called the California Crown. Now I don't know when exactly it's going to start, but it's going to be a similar idea with a big handicap race with a huge purse. Basically, just to kind of have an event day at Santa Anita, similar to what the Pegasus is at Gulfstream, and I had so so multiple thoughts about this. Like the the I think the Pegasus has done a good job, you know, getting people to the track mm-hmm. in Miami where there's a lot to do. So I think the idea is like L.A. Hollywood trying to stand out like that. But my feeling is, you know, with all the issues going on at Santa Anita, having trouble filling fields, and just very uncertain future for Southern California, California racing in general, like. 
Is that the best use of resources, is my question, to put all the purse money into just one big day? Especially since Santa Anita gets the Breeders' Cup, like, pretty much every year, at least every, every other, other year. year. So they already have that event that if you market it right, people will come out from L.A. So I don't know. I have mixed feelings about that. What do you think? Well, I think it's a case of, you know, looking at something and, and seeing it as a success and then saying, if this works, then if we replicate it and do it again somewhere else at the revenue, that it'll work just as well. And I'm not a big believer in that in this case. Um, I don't think sequels ever do as well. I mean, you could talk about Deadpool 2 probably being the best sequel out there, maybe outside of Godfather 2, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother show. But otherwise, I, I think that, that sequels don't hold up um, and that basically this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to replicate this West Coast now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and from my understanding, um, you know, even though, and you can say that, that the, this weekend in Miami was really successful. There was $47 million that were, that was wagered, um, on Pegasus day, mm -hmm. which is incredible. But I've heard, you know, that even though they have you know, tens of millions of dollars, um, wagered that day, they lose on average six to $7 million on Pegasus day. And it's because of the appearance fees and because of all the different you know security they have to put in and all the things they have to they have to ramp up in order to make it work. So to me, if you're if you're doing this to highlight Santa Anita, then that's 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 fine. Okay, if you're doing it because Belinda Stronach wants to have a second party, um, then then you have to look at it and say, okay, is that worth five to seven million dollars of loss again um, to do it to do it again? Um, you know, I remember there was a, a really bad movie called Reindeer Games uh -huh. that. Uh, ben Affleck was in, and uh, at one point in time, they were they were talking about you know one one of the thugs was like, you know, I went to business school, and uh, I think that did you know that ninety percent of all sales for toys is during the the Christmas season. I think we should have Christmas too <laughs> and July and try to re, you know try to do that. I think this is exactly the same idea. It's like if it works, then let's just do it again. Right. It, but it, it then you lose the nuance of it. You lose the newness of it. I guess yes. you should say. Um, the uniqueness and and it's a great show. It's a great day mm -hmm. of racing. They, I I think you know from Gulfstream standpoint, top to bottom, the races were really really good. Yeah. I mean they were they were great betting races. There were some great intrigue in in a lot of the races. You can make a case that maybe the breeder. I'm sorry, the, the Pegasus itself was maybe like the third or fourth best race right. on the card. Yeah. Um, yet they had it was a full house. They sold out. You know, again, almost fifty million dollars worth of uh, worth of wagering going on. But at the end of the day, if you lose six million dollars, then why would you do it again other than just to be able to say, hey, here's our signature day? Yeah, no doubt. And I agree. Like this is, you know, we were ragging on the Pegasus dirt race, which it wasn't that great. And has gotten down in quality every year. But the card is is great. It's a yeah. great day of racing and it's needed, especially like in kind of a racing wasteland on the calendar. You know, right. there's really nothing else of note that goes on between the Breeders' Cup and like the first or like the last major round of Derby preps. Right. So it's needed. It gave us something to talk about. It gave, you know, people, you know, horse like integration gave him a race to run in, you right. know, because mm -hmm. after the Hill Prince, it was like, there's really nothing else on the calendar until the Derby Day turf right. race. So it's, I think it's a good springboard for the rest of the year, like you were saying. Yep. So overall, I think the card is, is great and much needed. It's just that, you know, the dirt race has fallen off because of the Saudi Cup. And it's, right. and it's also just the fun a function of horses not sticking around, mm -hmm. you know, because it's just it. You know, the idea was that this would be one last hurrah for horses before they go off the stud. But it's right. like that was it was one thing when the purse was twelve million dollars. Now that it's three million. Like, are you really going to risk that horse right. right before they go to stud for a three million dollar purse? Like, he's right. worth way more in the breeding shed. Right. But yeah, overall, it was, you know, I think it was a great day of racing and. I just, yeah, I don't think it's as easily replicable as like, right. let's just let's take this, let's, right. let's take bikini bikini bottom and move right. it over here. Yeah, right, take exactly. Take and move it. But, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like it's like when people try to replicate our podcast. It's exactly. just, you know, you can't oh, do it. You don't, don't, don't even screw with it. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work with other talking heads. It certainly doesn't work with other editors and, and producers for sure. Um, we don't even want to, we don't want to try. We don't want to right. think about that. Like, <laughs> you know, our bread is butter. <laughs> Rail Talk is sponsored by TaylorMade. TaylorMade obviously has a growing and impressive stallion roster that you should go check out, headed by Not This Time. Uh, they also are handling the Lothenbach dispersal that we mentioned earlier, going on at Facing Tipton on the digital platform this week. Uh, they obviously have a consignment coming up with the Facing Winter Mix sale, and they're going to be killing it again as they do every year with their consignments at the major, major sales. 
uh, the rest of the year. But I think there's a there's a personnel update that you have from Taylor. Well, I'm really pleased to, to make this announcement. Um, and that is our good friend and friend of the show, Jeff Hazlett. Um, has been uh, promoted to director of sales, um, which is really an honor for a couple of reasons. Number one is that you know Jeff's been there for th- over three decades um, and is tireless and has worked with us, um, you know, um, personally on our broodmare band and getting our, our sales uh, decisions all put together. He was instrumental in helping us put together um, a reserve for Wonder Wheel um, and just a really good guy um, and uh, and a smart smart man. Um, but the other reason why it's important. To me, you know, as, as an outsider looking in is family businesses are tough to, you know, gradually, you know, Im- improve your status on. And Jeff Hazlett, by being there for so long and putting in the time and just impressing everybody um, within and, you know, within the organization and within the family, he has risen to that probably the, the top spot. Um, for a non-family member at TaylorMade. So it's really quite an accomplishment for Jeff Hazlett. I couldn't be happier for him because he does a phenomenal job. Um, and uh, he's going to take TaylorMade to even new heights as the director of sales. All right, so we had the Eclipse Awards last week. Once again, shout out to Anthony and Aaliyah and Nathan and the editing team and Patty, even though she doesn't want to take credit uh, for winning the Eclipse Award. <laughs> you're, getting, you're taking this credit. Right. She's only going to take credit when we win an Eclipse Award. She's not going to take the, uh, the credit from the other way. Exactly. Way. exactly. You know, on that stage. Uh, but no, so shout out to them again. But I mean, unfortunately, I think the night was kind of taken over by the first <laughs> acceptance speech, uh, which was Mike Rapoli for her fierceness. It was like one of the wildest acceptance speeches you'll ever see. Any award show, if you haven't watched it, go watch it. Uh, I loved when they started playing him off and he, he made his daughter dance to like to dance to the music so he could keep talking. Right. I mean, it went on forever and it was rambling with kind of like his Twitter threads that he's put out. Uh, and I just, I, I don't know, it, it rubbed me the wrong way. I, I like Mike, honestly. I personally, like, I, I get along with him. Like, we've had him on the old show. And I think overall, he's, he's very passionate about racing and is overall good for the game. But it's just, like, I, I, I don't like these speeches where, like, he's shouting out other people, but at the same time making it all about himself. And right. I think that that's, like, this, the, the, the base of this whole commissioner thing was like, yeah, I do think that he has the right intentions for the game, but I think also he wants to be the grand poobah of right. racing. And that's just the the vibe I got from that speech. But just tell me some of your takeaways just from the whole night. Yeah, I mean, we'll start with the fiercest acceptance speech because, again, that was something you just mentioned. And it was the, the first award of the evening. I think after the award was was given, um, everyone had like a huge sigh of relief. Like, OK, good. We got that out of the way. Now we can <laughs> go on and, and have our and have our regular show. Um but, you know, last year, I remember Mike won the award um, and walked up there. And, you know, I know this is all sarcasm and everything, but he walked up there. And when they started to play the music to play him off, he walked over and threw hundred dollar bills at the, at, the, at the band, which, uh, you know, up here, that's that's sarcasm. But everywhere else, that's just in bad taste. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really rude. It's, it, it's, it's a way of showing, like, I'm above the rules and I'm just going to throw money at this. Literally throw money at this to make this go away. Yeah. So this year, he, did, he wasn't quite as egregious. But as soon as he walked up on the stage for, for fierceness, Fierceness's win, he turned the clock around. So that way, yeah. that you know, was no, kind of funny. That way, nobody like that. could see. But that, that was his move you right, know, to right. be able to do it. And then he ignored the clock altogether yeah, after that. Exactly. Um, you know, people are up in arms about the fact that he was cursing and his daughter was up there. I'm sure it's not the first time she's heard someone say fuck, right. okay? Uh, let alone him. Right. So that really doesn't, doesn't uh, you know, move me one way or the other. The thing that I was disappointed about, though, um, was here's a, here's a guy who wants to be commissioner, okay? And had a, had a Twitter poll of 40 people who voted for him. Legally binding. Yeah, legally binding, exactly. That he is now the commissioner. Yeah. Um, but if you're really going to be a leader of the industry and you're actually physically in the same room as the other leaders of the industry, you know, from the Jockey Club and the NTRA and, and a lot of the other alphabet groups, you would think that if you really wanted to get together and collaborate, that that would be the week to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, that somebody would say, hey, guys, let's all get in a room together since we're all here and kind of hash out how we can do this together. And And I know, you know, Mike was saying all the right things, selfless over selfish. And, you know, let's get this game going, you know, from from the inside out. But if you really wanted to to improve the game and say, I'm going to be collaborative, then that is the perfect time to do it. And I know for a fact he was there for the majority of the week. So it wasn't like he flew in 
you know, and then and then immediately got on a plane and flew out the next day. If if really your goal is to to bring everyone together, then that was the perfect opportunity to do it, and it was a missed opportunity. Um, and and again, as a person who who normally um, is a pessimist, I would say that your real intentions aren't to get everyone in the room together physically or literally, and you know, and and try to hash this out. It's to rise above and try to be the like you mentioned the grand poobah of the industry. Um, so that way, people have to like, kiss the ring um, in order to get things done. And again, I agree with your sentiment. I think Mike is a hardworking guy. He's obviously you know a billionaire twice over. Um, he's he's done tremendous jobs, and I know that. You know, he he's a friend of my father's, so I, I always tread lightly, you know, about criticizing him. But I really feel like that if his heart's in the right place and he wants to make this industry better, then doing it collaboratively is the best way to do it. Not throwing fits on Twitter when somebody questions you I know, know, yeah. what, what your intentions are. That's the thing, too, is like, I, like you said, I think his intentions are good. But like a lot of times it's like a lot of words to like say not that much like we're still waiting for a lot of the specifics right. of the nta and you know what he and pat cummings are really going to do and really try to organize to help the industry go forward because anytime i see criticism and it's from tinky like if <laughs> tinky, right. tinky's become like the horse the, racing the, twitter the celebrity now. Right. Yeah. like yep. yeah like he's he's gaining followers by the day and so tinky had usually has these like very detailed and, and very smart commentary yeah, well on, on Mike and, and what he's saying and what he says his vision is. And then every time Mike responds to him, it's always some like iteration of, oh, I got more money than you or right. like, I'm always on your mind or something like right. that. Like this is like you're saying, like this is a chance to have that collaboration or at least have that dialogue with somebody who's also like obviously not the same stature as Mike, but makes good points and has you know, thoughts about how to improve the game. Like right. to me, it's it's got to be more than talk and slogans and catchphrases like the Titanic iceberg thing that he said right. in the speech. It's just like, okay, where are the specifics? And when someone calls you out and asks for the specifics, like you got to do more than just like throw a gif at him. Right. And, you and know, try to attack like, him. see you later. Like I, right. I got to go on my yacht or whatever. You know what I'm right. saying? Like this is this is a chance to try to put your money where your mouth is in a manner of speaking, because he's got plenty of money, right? And just have have that dialogue and try to come up with you know ways to improve the game specifically, right? Right. Yeah. And, and and we'd love to have that kind of collaboration and discussion on this show. Come on. Um, so it doesn't even necessarily have to be Mike. It, it's you know whether it's Pat or it's somebody from one of the other organizations with the idea of how are we going to get people together? Because you know Patty reminded us this morning that one of the the key components of us revitalizing this podcast was because we wanted to encourage people to have honest conversations and we don't always agree with them and mm -hmm. you and I don't always agree. And mm -hmm. that's, that's actually okay because that kind of fosters additional thinking and creative working together um, to try to bridge a gap and try to, try to, you know, come together um, and, and have, you know, suggestions and, and make this industry better. Cause at the end of the day, that's what I think everyone wants to do. Everyone wants to have this industry continue for decades down the road and I don't disagree with Mike's sentiment about, you know, that we're on the Titanic and, and there's the iceberg. Um, and you can say it 15 different ways. It's true. But we have to, this is like kind of our swan song. We have to get our shit together. Otherwise, the industry is not going to be around for, you know, for my kids. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we have we, we have all the same goals and right. a, lot, a, lot, a lot of similar ideas on how to improve the game. But you just, you got to get down to brass tacks eventually and talk right. these things through specifically and not just wave your hand and say, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. Right. If somebody calls you out, dismiss them. Like, to me, that's been the issue so far with, with Mike and his Twitter threads and his speech right. and all that. I think he's got the right attitude, but it's just there's got to be more, you know, it's, it's got to be enumerated. It's got to be more, it's gotta, yeah. Yeah, it's so. gotta be more substance. And you can't sit there and say, I'm going to go ahead and boycott sales and then literally the next September sale buy $30 million worth of horses. <laughs> But but be that as it may, that that was that was one takeaway from from mm -hmm. the uh, from the from all the the hoopla there. Ladies and gentlemen, he's going to the notes. Um, I thought it was interesting that up to the mark won the Breeders' Cup. Oh, excuse me, won the Eclipse Award. And again, the team went up there, and Mike kind of dominated and took over the the conversation. I laughed. At, I laughed at the end of his speech on that one. It was not quite as memorable as mm -hmm. as the the fierceness. But that horse up to the mark, he owns in partnership with Vinny Viola. So Vinny was actually up on the stage. And again, Mike didn't give one 
second of airtime to anybody else to thank. It was it was his podium to the point where his when they all started going up there to to accept the award, Mike's daughter walked up to the to the microphone and said, "Hello, everybody." And those were two words more words than Vinnie Viola said in the five different Eclipse Awards that Vinnie Viola has won. So you know, again, it's 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 just it's tough. It's tough. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about was um, Stuart Janney's merit uh, award, Eclipse Award of Merit. Eclipse yeah. award of merit. Um, and I thought it was a really subtle dig that he had when he went up there and walked up. And the very first thing he said is, I'm not going to abuse the one minute rule and kind of looked over. And I don't know if he was looking over at Mike's table or not, but he made it a very specific point to do that. Um, and then went on and rambled for eight minutes. So, you know, and I actually timed it. It was, you know, it was if, if you look at the award ceremony from one hour and 24 minutes to one hour and 32 minutes, it's Stuart Janney. And I even fast forward through it. And it was still boring and, and monotone. So it was just faster. But, you know, be that as it may, there's a lot of things that people can talk about whether or not he deserves to have, a, a, you know, a award of merit. Why this year they immediately wanted to make sure that he got the award of merit. Um, it was it was very self-satisfying, mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, for, for a lot of that group. And I'm not saying that he doesn't deserve, he does or doesn't deserve the award. Um, but I know there are a lot of other people, in my mind at least, that would deserve it more. Um, and I thought it was interesting. The last thing I'll say is I thought it was interesting also that he said, you know, I, I sit in my house in Maryland and I look at the two Eclipse Awards that we've earned already. And they were both for Ruffian. And Ruffian was 40 years ago, mm -hmm. 50 years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which shows you how difficult it is to win an Eclipse Award. So the fact that you've won one and Patty's won one and, and we've won. I mean, that, that's a big I mean, deal. Anthony's won three. And three. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, sorry. Patty has two. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. She's like, I don't want to take any credit, but, but, I, have but I have two. Cut. Um, yeah, exactly. So he, he said, I thought it was funny. He said, you know, I look at those awards with, I'm not saying, you know, exactly, but I look at those awards with, with great pride. And he should. He very well should. Because Ruffian was just a phenomenal, you know, horse and, and, and part, you know, athlete in our industry. Legend. Legend. Um, but his next comment was, so this award, you know, so, so Ruffian had, you know, had those two Eclipse Awards and I had nothing to do with those. Okay, which I, I understand he's trying to be humble. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, but this award fixes that, which basically means that like, okay, so now all the work and everything like that that I've put into the industry, you know, I'm deserving of, of this award that, oh, by the way, I think I, I'm giving to myself. So it, again, it, you know, you're trying to be humble when you're winning awards. You try to thank all the right people and everything like that. I, I think that was where his heart was. But it just wasn't verbalized as well as I think he could have done. <laughs> oh, John, you know, John, it's getting spicier by the week on this show. I love, no, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. And I think what we could all agree on is like, we need a hard time limit on these speeches, dude. Like, that was like the best year was the COVID year. Right. And right. No, they had no physical ceremony. And Patty and I had to, we had a little acceptance thing for yeah. our Eclipse Award. And they were strict. They yeah. were like, we were like 55 seconds. They were like, nope, 45 yeah, that's seconds. Right. That's right. Cut it. Yep. Yep. And which is fine. And it's yeah. just like, I don't know. There has to be like, like a clown that comes out with a cane or something. Right. Or something. Yank somebody or, or just turn the mic off. Just turn the mic off. That's yeah. all. You know? And like, go from there. It's just, and it, it's, it's very emblematic, I think, of the industry where there's so many like people that just love to pat themselves on the back. Right. And it's just like, this is. This should be a night for celebrating the horses and the people well, behind the horses. And like, yep. you know, that's what you were talking about Bill Mott before. Right. Like Bill Mott's speech was short, sweet, thanked the right people yeah. and got the hell out of there. It was like know? a minute long. You yeah, know, it was perfect. So, yeah, this is just uh, it's just a plea for me to like, please have like a harder time limit on these speeches because it's unwatchable. Right. It's, uh, whether or not I agree with what the person is saying or whether or not I agree with them getting the award, it's just unwatchable because it is so much fluff in there and it's otherwise like a night that should be very celebratory. Right. Rail Talk is sponsored by The Green Group. It's our Green Group guest of the week today is my boy Cyrus. Uh, go hit Len Green up at greencode.com and what's the phone number? 732 Six three four five one hundred. There we go. So call them up. Len will do a half hour consultation for free for Rail Talk listeners. Guarantees he'll find you tax savings. Tax season is upon us. We're about two months away from tax day. And uh, any, any tax breaks for Cy? Wait, I'm getting I'm getting a call in from Len directly. He said that now that Cy is part of the show, you can write him off. Ah! 
Sai, all your vet bills there are you covered go. now. Well, yep. see, Len is fighting savings even for the canines amongst us. He obviously can do well for you and everybody in the horse business. They have, they have over 800 clients in the horse business at the Green Group. Uh, they won a billion races. Got a couple of big starters coming up this weekend that we're going to get to. Uh, Len's the man knows everything about the business, counting, horse racing. He's just a fount of knowledge. And how to depreciate dogs. Yeah. All right, so now that no one is going to be paying attention to us as for, really for, frankly the, so. for the rest of the show, we'll try to make this last segment pretty quick. Uh, we got some big racing coming up this weekend at Gulfstream. Uh, we got the Holy Bull stakes, a couple other three year old stakes. We got the, the Swale, the Forward Gal, and uh, we might be down there in Miami. John will be down there for sure. I think I might make the trip as well. Uh, we have uh, West Point has Born Noble, who is a nice first out winner for Todd Pletcher, who's going to be in a one other than allowance. He got a 93 buyer first time out. Wow. Uh, we have Legalize, who we own a small port- portion of, who's going to be in the Swale stakes, trained by Cherie DeVoe. Uh, what do you guys got going on? We have uh, Deadpan in a grade three uh, on the turf. Um, we have uh, Golden Ghost um, looking to make three wins in a row um, in the uh, in the grade three on the turf. And then uh, the big horse, we weren't sure that we were going to run Hades in the Holy Bowl because, um, you know, quite frankly, we didn't want to run against Fierceness. Mm-hmm. But we went ahead and entered him. He got a great post. He's in the number one hole. Um, looks like we're prim- prim- you know, primarily the speed and Paco is going to ride him again. Uh, mm-hmm. The horse is undefeated two for two. And. You know, we'll see if we can get lucky, but we will be down there in Miami on Saturday. Hell yeah. And that, I think that race has turned out to be pretty live. Like a couple of horses that were behind him that day have come back to win. So yeah. really excited to see what he can do. Obviously, fierceness is the horse to be, but you never know. First time, we'll have to lay off what they're going to bring. I, I can tell you honestly from, from dealing with, with two-year-olds to three-year-olds, sometimes they don't make that jump. Sometimes yeah. they peak it too. Now, I think that the horse has got a tremendous amount of talent. And, you know, he ran like 103 buyer when, when he won uh, the, the Breeders' Cup. Um, so certainly, you know, he could even bounce or not run to that level and still probably win this race. Um, but at this stage of the game, you can't you can't avoid any good horses in any of these derby preps. Yeah, no, I mean, it's going to the rubbers meet in the road real soon and the derby points are going to be very, very valuable. So even if you can run second or third, that'll you know put a, a big step towards mm-hmm. getting into the derby field. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what fierceness does because. He's got those three races. He's got two monster races and one total stinker, yeah. which I don't know, maybe he just didn't like the slap that day. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see if he can continue on, like be more consistent throughout the year um, because he's going to have to have his running shoes on to, to win the Holy Bowl on Saturday. You know, speaking of three-year-olds and three-year-old stakes, there was a little news that came out last night because yesterday was the, we are recording this on Tuesday the 30th. Yesterday the 29th was the deadline that Churchill Downs had set for trainers, for uh, owners to move their horses from Bob Baffert to somebody else in order to be able to run in the Derby. And I was pretty surprised nobody did, yeah. really. Like, Starlight didn't do it. Balma Corp didn't do it. Doesn't look like the uh, Pegram and Watson and them are going to do it. Right. That's shocking to me that they would have that amount of loyalty to Bob Baffert and skip on a chance to run in the 150th Kentucky Derby. I mean, you know, say what you will about Bob, and I've said plenty of things about him, but he clearly has very strong relationships with these owners yep. that they're they're willing to kind of fall on the sword for him. What was your reaction? It, no, quite. I had the exact same reaction, and I thought about it. Uh, you know, Joe, as to if one of our trainers was in a similar position, what would we do? And and, and I can understand why the owners are siding, you know, with with their trainer um, in in this case. Uh, you know, and you can again. We've been very harsh on on Bob Baffert over the years, um, and and you know I, I you know I'm unashamed about it. I, I mean, think deservedly so. Deservedly really so. Most cases. Um, and again, Gamin was one of my favorite horses, you know, of, of the past twenty years. So uh, you know, I was following her with with, with great interest. It, it, but at some point in time, you have to look at, at Churchill Downs and say, all right, now they're just doing him a dirty. I mean, now it's been two years of a ban. The first two years of the, uh, you know was was the initial ban, and. I think that even though he, he being Bob and his attorneys got into it on, uh, you know, on, on kind of laying out their, their dirty laundry for the public to see and, and saying, look how unfair Churchill's being, um, it, that wasn't the right thing to do. And I think they kind of stopped that strategy. But now Churchill's, I think, being really vindictive and basically saying, look, you embarrassed us mm-hmm. and you tainted our legacy in the Oaks and the Derby. Um, so we're going to continue to kick this down the road and, and have you be sanctioned um, and suspended. So, you know, I understand where both parties are coming from, but I think at a certain point in time, you have to say, the guy did his time. This is what you said his sentence was. He did it. And now you got to move forward. So 
I give the owners a lot of credit for um, basically skewing and saying we are going to bypass the Kentucky Derby altogether um, and the Kentucky Oaks for that matter and uh, and see if we can uh, you know win some of the other races and basically take a little bit of the luster away from from those you know, from the Derby and the Oaks. Now that being said, again, Twitter is its own monster and certainly people are saying, oh, without Bob Bob, Bob Baffert and his horses there, it's going to be a, you know a, a tainted race and. And they shouldn't even run it without the best horses of all time. I don't think they're going to put an asterisk next to no. the winner of the 150th Kentucky Derby because Bob Baffert's horses weren't in there. Um, you know, very easily horses get hurt. So whenever you win a big race like that um, or they get scratched, you know, the morning of because of a, a illness or, or they can't run, nobody says, well, that horse wouldn't have won if this horse was in it. You go with, you know, you kind of run with the horses that are in the race and you can't be apologetic about it. If you win the Kentucky Derby, you win the Kentucky Derby. It means that you were the best horse on that day mm -hmm. um, as, as a three-year-old. So yes, it's going to be a little bit watered down, um, but I don't think it's going to be so catastrophic that people are going to be embarrassed to stand up there with the trophy. <laughs> no, of course not. The Kentucky Derby is still the Kentucky Derby, but you know, like you were saying, you know, we said this before, for them to extend the ban on him when there was no new information, mm -hmm. like kind of said it all in terms of what their true motivations were. Right. And yeah, I got to tip my hat to, to Baffert's owners. Like there's a lot of guys I don't agree with, <laughs> I yeah. think amongst that crew. A lot of guys. Amongst yeah. that yeah. crew. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's taking a stand mm -hmm. against what some they feel is unjust. So, you know, I'm, I'm always in favor of that. And yeah, I mean, like I said last week, like, 2025 comes around. I don't want to hear about this right, exactly. anymore. Like, can we all just move on from right. something that happened in 2021? I think it's best for Baffert. It's best for Churchill. It's best for the sport. 2025, let's just have a derby with all the best horses and let's squash the beef. All right. So that's going to do it for episode 25 of Rail Talk Live from the Brooklyn Palace. Thank you to John for coming all the way down here up, or up here. Yeah, we made it through the subway ride and the walk through Scary bed -Stuy. No, I was kidding. He, he had good things to say about the neighborhood. And, you know, we love it here. <laughs> Let's just say that in front of Meg. Uh, <laughs> uh, but shout out to Patty Wolf as well for coming down and setting everything up. Uh, she's the greatest, as are Anthony LaRocca, Olivia LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson, our associate producers and editors. And thank you to Sai for making his way upstairs as he squirms out of my hands, um, for brightening our day as he does every day here in Meg and Brooklyn. Thank you to our sponsors and the viewers. We'll see you next week here on Rail Talk. Joe, John, are you there? Are you coming to me? Remember, tackle or trade? I guess they don't need me this week.